good evening everyone i think after two very three very enlightening sessions it's now my pleasure to do little different what we have discussed since afternoon what i'll be doing is to discuss how diabetes heart failure and renal dysfunction are deadly trio natural course of the disease the flow of my session will be first to discuss cardiovascular disease heart failure and kidney complication in patient with type 2 diabetes how we can reduce the risk of cv disease heart failure and kidney complication in patient with type 2 diabetes and what do guidelines suggest when it comes to management of type 2 diabetes with these comorbidities we all know there is a very significant and very dynamic relationship which exists between systemic uh, uh, metabolism heart and kidneys so once we know that heart is the most metabolically demanding organ which is susceptible to changes in volume as well as to metabolism so metabolism by liver pancreas and fat is essential for healthy functioning of organs like heart and kidneys we all know that and it is the kidney which plays a very very important role once it comes to glucose glucose homeostasis or volume homeostasis or even blood pressure regulation so there has been lot of evidence trying to link systemic metabolism heart and kidneys and lot of studies have proven that fact that acute or chronic dysfunction in heart kidneys or systemic metabolism may induce dysfunction in another so each dysfunctional organ perpetuates dysfunctionality in other organ through a variety of mechanisms and it is type 2 diabetes which itself carries huge risk of cardiovascular disease kidneys and now we know even heart failure let's talk about metabolic dysfunction first and we know if there is a metabolic abnormality it is going to affect both cardiac and kidney disease progression as well as outcomes moment there is a metabolic dysfunction in the form of hyperglycemia dyslipidemia insulin resistance or altered hormonal milieu it will induce inflammatory adipokines and that will lead on to fibrosis endothelial dysfunction into the kidneys with ultimately declining kidney function onset of microalbuminuria increase in glomerular filtration in the beginning and subsequently fall in egfr and fluid retention <clears throat> in the heart it leads on to fibrosis with acute endothelial dysfunction there is going to be an onset of early heart failure and rampant atherosclerosis on long term basis so even cardiac dysfunction will add to kidney and metabolic burden so if there are cardiac abnormalities that is going to affect both kidney and metabolic disease progression and ultimately the outcomes so in cardiac dysfunction if you have early neurohormonal activation or hypoperfusion or volume overload that will lead on to arterial resistance and autonomic dysfunction which not only will increase free fatty acid level worsen dyslipidemia and insulin resistance but in kidneys also it will increase hypertension onset of microalbuminuria and subsequently progression to macroalbuminuria and there will be a declining kidney function and kidney dysfunction will add to cardiac and metabolic burden the moment you have kidney dysfunction there is an over activation of ras and nss system there is going to be sodium and fluid retention hypertension arterial calcification which will induce oxidative stress and will worsen glomerular hyperfiltration which will further worsen insulin resistance and that will also lead on to ventricular hypertrophy ventricular failure vascular dysfunction endothelial dysfunction and rampant atherosclerosis subsequently so once it comes to overall type 2 diabetes course in a patient we know these patients are at a increased risk of complication due to metabolic disturbances and interconnected risk factors which we just discussed so all those patient those who have clustering or risk factor like obesity hypertension dyslipidemia and smoking with further worsening of insulin resistance there is going to be a gradual beta cell dysfunction which will predispose to all micro as well as macroangiopathy it could be simply onset of microalbuminuria subsequently leading on to nephropathy or maybe rampant atherosclerosis peripheral neuropathy or even macrovascular diseases like heart failure mi or stroke or even dementia and we know large proportion of patient with type 2 diabetes they have cv disease almost one third of patient with type 2 diabetes they have cv disease so it's not very surprising once we say that patient with type 2 diabetes with cv disease will also have increased complication in the form of mi stroke heart failure or ckd also as compared to someone who is not having cv disease in the setting of type 2 diabetes and we know that it is cv disease which accounts for 
higher morbidity or mortality in all patients, whether those patients have underlying CKD or myocardial infarction. <clears throat> Even CKD and heart failure are most frequent cardiorenal disease manifestation in patients with type 2 diabetes. And this is what has been shown in this wonderful data of almost 7 lakh patients that CKD and heart failure together accounted for almost 60% new onset. And these were one of the earliest manifestation coming much earlier than stroke, MI or peripheral vascular disease. And we know heart failure itself, these days we talk about heart failure that this is unfortunately not getting diagnosed correctly. And it is one of the most important complication which might happen in the setting of type 2 diabetes. Almost 25 to 40 percent of patients with diabetes might have heart failure. Eric's study very clearly established that in 386 patients, a follow-up of five years, almost 68 percent patients had symptomatic or asymptomatic LV dysfunction, either HEFREF or HEFREF. And we know another cardiac screening of 580 patients has shown that 28 percent patients, they had subsequently, if they were more than 60 years, they had again HEPREF or preserved or uh, preserved heart failure in almost 28% of patients. So having said that, heart failure is very, very important. So is kidney also, which is again one of the earliest and very highly prevalent complication in setting of type 2 diabetes. So if you follow type 2 diabetes patient during the course of disease, almost 50, 15 years down the line, about 50% patient will have either albuminuria, impaired EGFR or both setting to higher cardiovascular mortality because moment you have coexistence of type 2 diabetes with kidney disease, overall mortality may go up by almost five times as compared to someone who only has type 2 diabetes or albuminuria. So moment you have type 2 diabetes with albuminuria and reduction in EGFR, there is going to be almost four to five times increase in overall mortality in this patient. Even heart failure and kidney function also decline and these seem to be very, very interconnected because if you see that all those patients, those who have heart failure in the setting of CKD, again, the mortality in these patients is very, very high as compared to someone who does not have heart failure with CKD because even CKD patient might ultimately have higher CV mortality. They may not die of CKD. Actually, they may die of CV mortality. So let's see whether we can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, heart failure or kidney complication in patient with type 2 diabetes. So if we go through the meta-analysis of all major trials like ACCORD, Advanced UKPDS and Wedded trial, they have shown only modest benefits in terms of overall CV events, in terms of MI or reduction of all-cause mortality. It has not been very, very impressive. Of course, UKPDS has shown us that 20 years, there was a reduction in micro risk by almost 25% by 1% HUNC reduction. But that was not p-value wise significant in first 20 years when it comes to MI. But once these patients were followed for another 10 years, even that MI protection or reduction by 15% was p-value wise significant. Although micro benefits were still identical even 10 years after those patients are out of that major UKPDS trial. And we know today these days with SGLT2 inhibitor or the GLP-1 receptor agonist, all MACE outcomes are much better. You talk about Emperec, there has been a reduction by 14%. And same was seen in Canvas trial in three-point MACE by getting reduced by 14%. Although declared TINI initially has shown, shown only 0.7% reduction, which was not P-value-wise significant. But overall, if you see CVD with heart failure, that was significantly down by almost 22%, even in declared TINI trial. But GLP-1 receptor agonist leader has concluded clearly shown that with liraglutide, there was a reduction in three-point mace by 13%. And surprisingly, with injectable semaglutide in sustained six, there was actually a reduction in overall three-point mace by 26%, which was very, very impressive. Once it comes to CV death outcomes in SGLT2 or in GLP-1 receptor agonist CV outcome trials or all cardiorenal trials in patients with type 2 diabetes, we know Emperor has only shown a CV death reduction by 38%. In fact, all three-point MACE uh, endpoints were driven through a reduction in CV death by 38%. And it was only in lethal trial with liraglutide that there was a reduction in overall CV death by 22%, which was p-value wise significant. Although Pioneer in oral semaglutide has shown significant reduction by 51%, but p-value wise, it was not very, very significant. Once it comes to hospitalization with heart failure, 
consistently all SGLT2 inhibitors, whether it was EMPA, CANA, DAPA, or other uh, itoglifluorazine, they have shown reduction in risk for hospitalization with heart failure by almost 35%. Although GLP-1 receptor agonists in terms of heart failure have not shown much benefits except the later trial with uh, eraglutide. But once it comes to composite kidney outcomes in SGLT2 inhibitor or in GLP-1 receptor agonists, all trials are again unanimous and they are aligned in terms of composite renal endpoints, which are down by almost 30 to 40 percent, may be with EMPA, CANA, or DEPA. And similarly, a trend in reduction in albuminuria has been seen in a later trials, sustained, and even in rewind with dilaglutide. So, metabolic and CV kidney benefits of SGLT2 inhibitor. In type 2, these are mediated through multiple mechanisms. So once we talk about drugs like SGLT2 inhibitor versus GLP-1 receptor agonist, these drugs are not identical, although actions seem to be synergistic. Because with SGLT2 inhibitor, there is primarily diuresis. Glucose excretion gets increased and natriuresis is there. So that leads on to change bioenergetics to the myocardium. There is going to be reduction in intraglomerular pressure, which reduces left ventricle wall stress and mass. And subsequently, there is a reduction in inflammation and oxidative stress. So preload and afterload gets corrected. That is how there is an immediate reduction in hospitalization with heart failure as early as 28 days. Renal composite endpoints also significantly go down. So is reduction in blood pressure, HV1C and body weight also. But once it comes to GLP-1 receptor agonist, again, mechanism proposed are different because there is increase in insulin secretion, glucagon suppression happens with GLP-1 receptor agonist. Of course, it also leads on to natriuresis, diuresis and appetite suppression. So there is true reduction in inflammation. Lipids also gets corrected and coagulopathy also gets improved. And there is an improvement in LV function. That is how CV events are much altered in the long run, especially those patients who have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with GLP-1 receptor agonist. There is a reduction in albuminuria, blood pressure, body weight, as well as HV1C. Let's see what guidelines say once it comes to management of type 2 diabetes in relation to established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, presence of heart failure, or maybe diabetic nephropathy. So ADA22 clearly said that after lifestyle modification and, of course, diabetes education, if you have to reduce overall burden of complication, it has not only to be the glycemic management, blood pressure management is equally important. So is the management of lipids and all agents with proven benefits for CV risk reduction and kidney benefit or renal composite endpoints should be used early so as to get all these benefits. So guidelines are absolutely unanimous. Whether you talk about ADA, ACE, or our own RSSDI, ASI guidelines that after HV1C control, it is blood pressure control, which is very, very important. So is the control of cholesterol, which stands for C. And drugs to protect both heart as well as kidneys, like GLP-1 receptor agonist, or maybe SGLT2 inhibitor. Of course, there is an importance of diet, exercise, which needs to be re-emphasized to every patient and very early screening for complication, an effort to reduce smoking or stop smoking and stress management goes a long way as so as to reduce overall increasing burden of micro as well as macro angiopathy. So an early use of these drugs, which can protect both heart and kidneys, probably will go a long way in cutting micro as well as macro as a complication in these patients. So to conclude, understanding cardiovascular disease, heart failure and kidney disease in patients with type 2 diabetes, it's a very, very strong and dynamic relationship which exists between systemic metabolism, heart failure or heart involvement and kidneys, type 2 diabetes, CV disease, heart failure and CKD are interrelated because worsening of any one disease, maybe CV or heart failure or CKD, will obviously worsen another system also. So guidelines and societies recommend the use of agents with proven CV and kidney benefits that too early in management of type 2 diabetes, especially if you have clustering or risk factors, presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or presence of diabetic nephropathy or heart failure right in the beginning. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing here and stand by for any interaction or questions.